Hello and welcome to the Live Forester TEI webinar, Maximizing Global Marketing ROI with Translation Technology, sponsored by Smartling and powered by the Target Marketing Group. I'm Drew James, Publisher and Brand Director for Target Marketing, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event. Before we get started, let me take a second to point out the Tips for Attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the Tech Tips video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click this widget for more information. I'd also like to invite you to register for our upcoming Integrated Marketing Virtual Conference happening on June 23rd. You can register for free via the widget on your console marked with a star. And one other item for all your social media users out there, please for today's webinar use Twitter handles at Smartling and at TargetMKTG and hashtag TMGWebinar to, so, to be socially active on today's event. Our presenters today are Sebastian Selhorst, Senior Consultant, Total Economic Impact at Forrester, Lily Varon, Analyst, eBusiness and Channel at Forrester, and Judd Marcello, Senior Vice President, Global Marketing at Smartling. Here's a little background on each of them. Sebastian is a consultant for Forrester's Total Economic Impact products and services. The TEI methodology focuses on measuring and communicating the value of IT and business decisions and solutions and providing an ROI business case based on the costs, benefits, flexibility, and risk of investments. Sebastian has more than eight years of professional experience in the telecommunications and IT outsourcing industry. Sebastian holds a French and German Master of Science from Ecole Centrale Paris with RWTH Achen and a specialization in computer science and telecommunications. He is fluent in English, German, and French. Lily Varon is an analyst serving e-business and channel strategy professionals. Her research focuses on the technologies that e-commerce firms need to transact with consumers in the age of digital business. Her research covers e-commerce solutions for digital and physical goods, global online payments, the translation and localization of global websites, and the digital transformation of the physical retail store. Her research also analyzes consumer online shopping behavior around the globe, with a particular focus on Latin America. Before joining Forrester, Lily worked as an advocate at an anti-poverty nonprofit agency, providing case management for clients in areas such as housing, utilities, insurance, immigration, and financial literacy. Lily holds a BA in American Cultural Studies from Bates College. She is fluent in Spanish as well as proficient in Portuguese. Judd Marcello came to SmartLink from Salesforce.com, Marketing Cloud, through its acquisition of Exact Target, where he was Senior Director Marketing EMEA. Prior to Salesforce, he held demand generation marketing and brand marketing roles at eBay, Enterprise Marketing Solutions, Canon Australia, Black & Decker, and Nestle. He is originally from New Hampshire and spent more than a decade living abroad in Australia and the United Kingdom. Judd holds an MBA from the Macquarie Graduate School of Management and a BA in Marketing from Plymouth State University. So without further delay, I'd like to turn things over to Lily. Take it away, Lily. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. So um, Drew did a wonderful job with the welcome and the introduction. I'm going to go in and talk about um, the market drivers for, for e-commerce globalization and the trends there, um, and then I'll hand it off to Sebastian to, to take it away from there. So first, you know, what what are we are we doing today? Um, we are looking at you know what what global global e-commerce looks like. Um, so you know, why are we as e-commerce companies globalizing? First thing, you know, I I want to cover here is that in every single market that Forrester uh, forecasts the e-commerce markets for, e-commerce is, is growing. So you've got rates like 10 to 12% to CAGRs in mature markets like the U.S., um, the U.K., Japan. Uh, and then in, in emerging markets, they're growing quite a bit faster. So we've got um, rates like 15% year over year in, in Mexico to um, upwards of 40 and 50% in, in India, which is the fastest growing market that we're forecasting. Um, and so firms are looking at these markets. They're seeing um, increased traffic coming from global uh, consumers. They're seeing, uh, you know, um, 
the growth rates sort of slowing down in their domestic markets and looking to diversify their revenues and tap into that global opportunity in, in these uh, you know, faster growing e-commerce markets. And when they do that, we see them uh, rolling out you know, their, their global uh, strategy and their global e-commerce sort of footprint in, in similar ways. Um, there's usually a first tier, um, which is you know, tapping into large developed e-commerce markets. You've got, um, as I mentioned, the U.S. and the U.K. Generally, you know, English-speaking markets target other English-speaking markets first, um, and then and then tapping into smaller markets that might be easily uh, targeted through the existing infrastructure for those first, you know, large domestic markets. The second wave tends to be markets that present uh, opportunities and significant opportunities for brands, but have some more hurdles. Um, than than the markets in that first tour so uh, tier so it could be <clears throat> um, anything from you know early stage markets where um, only certain categories have have migrated to um, uh, e-commerce like um, typically that's uh, consumer electronics easily you know comparable goods um, but haven't yet matured to to selling apparel and and more subjective categories online. Um, so that's you know like like uh, Indonesia and, and um, Mexico and India uh, today, um, and then it could be that they're just targeting an entirely new region where they haven't had any sort of footprint before, offline or online, and that tends to be today we hear markets you know like um, Saudi Arabia and other markets in the Middle East, Oman, United Arab Emirates is, is growing in interest today. Um, or that they're really digitally advanced countries with um, really good infrastructure, but but generally small in market size. So we hear you know Sweden and, and Switzerland in, in those cases. And then that final tier is is a wait and see for most brands. It's markets that have you know their significant interest based on you know growing e-commerce or really digitally savvy consumers, um, but where you know or, or a variety of other um, characteristics, but but where the political situation means that it's um, you know hard to invest in that market. You know we see that in, in Russia, we see that in Argentina, although it's shifting um, to also those you know emerging markets where there's really long-term potential, but but infrastructure is a is a challenge. You know we see that in in South Africa and Nigeria, for example. Um, the interesting thing though is that there's some brands you know with with particularly large global footprints that have taken the plunge uh, with e-commerce in, in, in all of these categories, including the weight and key market. Here, Adidas, Adidas has, uh, or Adidas, <laughs> to be, um, Sebastian will yell at me um, if, I, if I call it Adidas. Um, they, you know, they've targeted large developed markets. They've targeted early stage markets with, with longer term potential. Um, you know, they've got e-commerce in Malaysia. They've got e-commerce in Mexico. And, and they, they even have offerings in, in you know, smaller markets with, with good infrastructure and, and savvy consumers in, in Sweden and Poland. But you know what's more typical uh, is, is a smaller footprint. Um, so you'll see, you know, despite you know, the, the company's desire to establish a, a global footprint, that most international expansion efforts are still focused on that first tier um, or, or a handful of markets. Uh, Land's End here, you know, you can see has, has targeted their efforts on that first tier. They've got direct localized sites for, for you know, mostly mature large e-commerce markets and, uh, and, and two sort of smaller markets with, with a geographic proximity to, to their target markets. And we see that, you know, because generally um, global expansion is really expensive. You know, the technology alone, um, you know, there's often – uh, commerce technologies have quite restrictive um, usage terms, and so you have to purchase additional licenses to to operate that that commerce site in international markets. And those costs can be, you know, it's not unusual to hear it uh, costing five hundred thousand dollars per market, and that's just to um, just to get that commerce technology up and and you know just to turn that light on, to have permission to turn the lights on. Um, and then, you know, if, if you're on a revenue share model with your commerce technology, as soon as that, that um, <clears throat> you know, the, the market share increases in those markets, you can see, um, you know, the, that, that, uh, that ownership cost really ballooning. 
But, you know, and that's only the technology. You know, when we're talking about um, the, the associated services, you know, integration services, creative design, uh, translation and localization, other fulfillment partnerships, um, service partnerships, payment service providers, et cetera, et cetera, you know, it, it can easily um, skyrocket. And actually, when Forrester forecasted U.S. commerce technology spend and the spend on, on associated services like those um, that I mentioned, we found that a really good rule of thumb is that you will spend uh, generally five times the amount um, uh, on, on services versus the, the technology. So it's, it's a, a five to one ratio here, um, services to technology. So you can easily see how a g global rollout of localized sites can mean it can be a multi-million dollar investment. Um, and, and we also know, you know, translation can make up a bulk of that localization budget, just, you know, a, a, a one component of those, that larger um, initiative. So it really serves us all well in, in these cases to be really smart about localization. And, and I'm seeing, I'm actually seeing this happening. You know, firms are um, learning uh, as they go and, and maybe have been burned in a few initial rollouts. Um, so they're starting to get a little bit savvier about about this um, about these initiatives. And one of the ways I see it happening is they're exploring alternative approaches to to market entry. So you know, launching a direct localized site is actually you know on the farthest end of the spectrum in terms of investment um, and and resources. And there are other approaches to globalization. So we've seen cross border shipping, uh, you know, pick up. We've seen marketplace. Uh, Approaches also being explored, especially um, in China with, with the dominance of Tmall. I'm sure we're all uh, familiar with that. Um, but, you know, one of the things <clears throat> that we're seeing is that they're, they're making sure that their investment dollars in those direct sites are, are reserved for those markets that are really, um, you know, meriting that long-term commitment to that market. And in, even in that direct localized approach uh, and that site approach, we're seeing firms make more informed choices about their rollout strategy. One of the examples I love is Chelsea Football Club. So I don't know if there are any soccer fans in the audience, um, um, uh, but, but this is a, a, a soccer team from, um, from the UK. And you'll see that they're, if you look to the, to the right there on the screen, you'll see that they're actually, their direct site um, uh, list, their country rollout, it's actually quite unique. It doesn't look like um, what you might typically see in, in, in other, uh, with other firms. They could have very easily looked to their developed markets, their neighboring markets, France, Germany, et cetera. Um, but they decided to look for markets where there is a strong, strong base of, of soccer fans and not a really strong competitive uh, uh, local club to support. So, you know, fans looking for a team to support. So you'll see their rollout strategy. They've got Japan. They've got Indonesia. They've got Thailand, Korea. Um, and, and so they're they're uh, they're really um, tailoring their rollout strategy to their business. Um, and I think that's really smart. The other thing that, that we see happening um, is they're taking firms are taking more strategic decisions about localization, um, recognizing it as a, a work in progress, right? Um, content changes, uh, products change, consumer behaviors change, um, and, and really localization has to be a long-term iterative process. And, and we're seeing firms, you know, roll out with that understanding. I think a good example of this is AliExpress which is a, a cross-border, um, it's Alibaba's cross-border offering for Chinese manufactured goods. And they selected a few strategic languages to offer professionally translated sites for, right? They invested um, their time and resources in these target languages. They've got Russian and, and Portuguese um, for Brazil in particular. They've got site in Spanish and a site for France. Um, and the rest of the markets, they really they offer a, a ton of other uh, language translation, but it's all machine translated, and it, it's very transparent, right? Um, in these sites, you will be uh, receiving machine translated sites. Um, but there, you know, it's it's a really interesting um, look into um, Alibaba's sort of uh, strategy for localization here. And now, and, you know, I. I 
no discussion of, of e-commerce is complete uh, without discussing mobile. And I know we're all really sick and tired about hearing about the importance of mobile. It just keeps getting, um, uh, it, it, it keeps getting more and more important. But I really, I do have to drive this, this point home for you in the context of global commerce because, you know, localization strategy for e-commerce really truly means going beyond the experience your customer has your customers, your global customers have with you via PC. So if we can all sort of close our eyes and think about um, all the mobile, you know, advice and, and talk that we've had in the past few years, all the hoopla around mobile um, that we've heard about e-commerce here in the U.S., I, I want to hopefully illustrate for you that that's just even more important in, in many global markets. Because um, in, many, in many markets, those consumers are putting us to shame, you know, as it relates to their mobile expectations and what this graphic represents, which is, um, uh, you know, it's a score, it's, a, it's Forrester's Mobile Mind Shift Index. And what we did was score um, uh, consumers in those markets uh, 0 to 100 on how intensely those people are using their interactive mobile devices, um, you know, how frequently people interact with them, um, smartphones and tablets primarily, the diversity of locations in which they interact, um, inside, outside the home, you know, for example. And, and really you can see the U.S. average there is 27, um, that's with that dotted line, that vertical dotted line that we see here. Um, and, and you can see that Hong Kong, Indonesia, you know, Argentina, Brazil, China, many of these markets all surpass um, U.S. online adults for their, for their mobile intensity. And now the caveat here I do want to mention is that this isn't necessarily sales. We're not, we're not tracking mobile sales here, um, you know, mobile transactions or, or commerce, but really the, the frequency with which consumers are relying um, and using their mobile devices and the diversity of those contexts that they do that in. Um, but, but what it really illustrates is that in order to be where your customers are in many markets, um, even in smaller emerging e-commerce markets, this will mean um, meeting them on their on their mobile devices. Um, so you know, it's it's we, we might say it's important in the U.S., but in many emerging markets, it's even it, 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 it may be even more so. So um, mobile is an important piece of of that localization puzzle. And so finally, <clears throat> you know, just to to sort of cover the the um, the points that, that, we, that I've sort of introduced here um, to set the foundation for what we'll talk about the rest of, of this session, Glo growing online and mobile populations, um, driving a lot of, of e e this interest in, in e globalizing e-commerce. The markets are growing across the globe, you know, drawing a lot of attention from uh, um, U.S. brands, um, uh, European brands, but even now, you know, brands in maturing markets in Japan and in China, um, eyeing the European and, and U.S. markets for expansion. Um, brands are getting uh, re much savvier about their rollout strategies and localization tactics. They're really tailoring, you know, understanding that it, globalization is not a one-size-fits-all sort of recipe for success. They've um, taking a good look at their internal, you know, factors and, and, and also the um, characteristics of those global markets to make sure there's a good matchmaking process happening in, in, in forming their rollout strategy. And finally, that mobile really is an indispensable piece of the, of the localization puzzle, and it's only increasing in importance um, across the globe um, and, and Asia PAC in particular, but, but um, really a, an important factor con to consider as your thinking about localizing for, um, for those global markets. So with that, I will hand it over to Sebastian, um, who will talk about a really interesting study that, that uh, Forrester conducted. Yeah, thank you, Lily. Um, so I'm going to um, present you a, a very concrete example of a company that you know, wanted to expand internationally and that um, decided to use SmartLink's translation management technology to localize its websites and uh, web application. Uh, so today we will look at their business case. Um, so as we all know, or as um, Lily reminded us, 
the time, the efforts and the cost of a localization initiatives go far beyond the simple pervert translation costs. There are a lot of um, a lot yeah, more hidden overhead and management costs from, from both the um, business and the IT side. So SmartLink commissioned Forrester to pro provide an independent analysis of how you know, translation management technology can help companies contain the total localization costs while also accelerating the time to market. Uh, the outcome is this um, independent case study uh, that I wanted to present today. Um, with independent, I also mean that you know, Forrester does not endorse SmartLink or its offerings. Rather, the objective of this financial case study was to analyze the financial impact that SmartLink's translation management platform had on a particular customer, in this case, a business service provider. Uh, today, we will not have the time to go through all the details of this business case, but I'll, um, I will present you with the key findings. I think that the full case study uh, will be made available to you soon in case you're interested in further reading and exploring all the details um, after the webinar. So the title of this case study, as you've seen on the previous slide, is the total economic impact of SmartLink's enterprise translation management platform. And I just wanted to briefly clarify the terminology here. Uh, when we speak about the total economic impact, or in short, we call it a TEI, uh, this refers to Forrester's methodology for return on investment calculations. Um, the basic concept is shown in this graphic, which indicates the uh, different components of the total economic impact. TI does not only look at the total cost of a given investment, but wants to provide a complete economic picture of a technology investment. In addition to costs and cost savings, we also look at all areas where value has been created and where options for realizing future benefits might have been created, and we call this letter flexibility. The risk component is used as a filter to capture the uncertainty surrounding the cost and benefit estimates. Risk adjustments make uh, the number more conservative and, and should be taken as realistic expectations. So the four elements of costs, benefit, flexibility, and risk together form what we call the total economic impact. Um, so this is a customer-driven study. Uh, for this case study, we interviewed a business service provider. This company provides services via a cloud-based platform and is running a subscription-based business model. Uh, we asked the company about their initial pain points, what they were trying to achieve with their investment in a third-party translation management solution, um, how much they had to spend over the years, and of course, what they got in return, and we try to quantify this in financial terms. Uh, initially, although they already had customers all over the world, the, their services were only available in English, but they realized that uh, there was some friction in some of the non-English speaking countries, and that they had lower conversion rates in those regions. So they decided to localize their websites and the web application to you know, better engage with users, improve the conversion rates, and grow and thus grow the business in the non-English speaking countries. Um, the decision makers at this company had previous experience in creating and running localization initiatives at other companies. And they knew that you know, for one, they needed a flexible and scalable technology solution, and that you know, for two, building such a translation management system th themselves was not really an option for this company. It would simply have consumed too many resources and too much time. So the company was looking for a partner and decided to invest in SmartLink's uh, translation management platform and delivery network. This was you know, five years ago. Since, since then, they worked with SmartLink's technology to localize the company's websites and web application, and now um, it's available in 16 languages. Be before we look at the different benefits and the financial impact of the technology solution for the interviewed organization, I wanted to share with you a quote from one of the interviewees. 
um, the vice president of product was saying that SmartLink's technology has become the backbone of the company's localization efforts and that they look at SmartLink as a partner. He also said that SmartLink's technology helped the company to reach customers around the world a lot faster. So this already gives us a few hints as to where the benefits may lie. Now together with the interviewed organization, we identified three different benefit categories. So I mean how the organization benefits from the translation technology solution. And we quantified or estimated each in financial terms. So the first one is about incremental revenue from reduced time to market. The interviewed organization estimated that the third party technology solution helped them to reduce the time to market for its localized website and web application by 18 months. So these 18 months are here in comparison with the alternative scenario of having to build and maintain a translation management system by themselves. The accelerated time to market helped uh, to convert more users in the non-English speaking countries and increase the company's revenue and profit. Mm, just to give you an idea, before about 85% of the company's revenue came from the US. Five years later, the company told us that the share of revenue from markets outside the, uh, the US has increased from 15 to approximately 40%. Now, not all of this is due to localization efforts, but the technology helped to reduce the time to market. And together with the interviewed organization, we estimated the incremental revenue due to the accelerated time to market over the years. And based on an average margin for subscription revenue, we estimated their incremental profit to $4.3 million over the four, five years of this analysis. The second benefit that was quantified in this case study is about localization and IT staff cost avoidance. Um, based on their experience from localization initiatives at previous companies, um, the interviewees estimated that to come to a similar result with a homegrown translation management system, they would have required 10 full-time resources. In comparison, now with the vendor solution, they only employ three full-time resources to manage the system and the localizations into 15 languages. Um, the avoided costs have an estimated five-year risk-adjusted present value of 2.8 million for the interviewed uh, organization. Finally, content delivery um, network cost savings is the third benefit here. The interviewed organization uses uh, SmartLink's global delivery network to host and serve the web application in most regions. For these regions, the company therefore avoids paying for global data centers and content delivery networks. Um, the associated cost savings have been estimated to $695,000 for the interviewed organization. Um, here we see the three benefits as a pie chart. We talked about the reduced time to market, the localization, IT staff cost avoidance, and the content delivery network cost savings. Uh, the total of the benefits over the five years have a present value of $7.8 million. Um, the incremental costs for the interviewed organization, on the other hand, consist of technology costs, setup costs, localization staff costs, and training costs. So if we look at the total cost over five years, um, let me build this up. Um, the technology cost for the uh, translation management solution represent 43% of the total costs. The setup costs uh, cover the internal and external resources for the initial setup and integration of the technology and represent 1% of the total cost. The localization staff cost form the largest part and represent 54% of the total cost for the interviewed organization. Uh, they take into account the core localization team of three full-time resources that I mentioned earlier. And finally, the training costs represent 2% of the total cost. In total, we look at an investment of $2.2 million over the five years. I should maybe add here that in this business case, we do not consider the cost for the actual translations. Um, the interviewed organization uses an external translation agency and some internal resources for quality assurance. 
But our business case here is not about the company's entire localization program. Rather, we wanted to analyze the impact of the technology. Uh, the interviewed organization decided to invest in SmartLinks technology, but the alternative for them would have been to build the processes and tools themselves. So for that reason, we assumed that the actual translation cost would have been the same in both scenarios, and they are not included here. Now, putting it all together, the costs on the one side, the benefits on the other, analyzed over a period of five years. Overall, the interviewed organization achieved a positive risk-adjusted return on investment of 252% and a payback within 12 months. The net present value of this investment is $5.6 million. So these are the, the results for the interviewed organization. Of course, we cannot make any assumptions as to the potential ROI that other organizations will receive, but I hope that this case study sheds some light on what kind of benefits an organization can achieve with this kind of investment in a third party translation management platform and how you could try to estimate estimate its um, financial value. And again, to um, summarize the business case, I'd like to quote one of the persons we interviewed. Uh, looking back, the senior vice president of corporate and business development confirmed that they had made the right uh, build versus buy decision. The decision to invest in a third party technology was not only the better economic trade-off, as he says, but also enabled them to reach a lot of markets fairly quickly. Um, with this, I hand it over to Judd from Smartling, uh, who will share some thoughts about you know, selecting the right translation technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. So as Lily mentioned before, brands are aggressively adopting to the growing demand and behaviors of global consumers. And if you're a U.S.-based or U.S.-centric brand that is looking to take advantage of the growing e-commerce trends in non-English speaking countries, you must be prepared to meet the expectation of global consumers. So a recent study from the Common Sense Advisory revealed these two telling stats. 72% of global consumers indicated that they prefer to use their native language when shopping online. In fact, 55% of these consumers say they would only buy from a website in their native language. And I think this second stat is even more compelling. 56% of global consumers said that the ability to obtain information in their own language is more important than price when shopping online. If brands aren't prepared to meet the expectations of their global customer base with properly translated and localized experiences, they will be at a serious competitive disadvantage. Okay, let's go back to that headline stat uh, from our ROI of translation technology report that Sebastian mentioned, 252% return on investment. So in order to achieve this type of result, brand needs to jettison the legacy translation services model and adopt a technology mindset in their approach to translation and localization. The truth is the legacy status of translation is extremely manual and relies heavily on pre-web technologies like email and spreadsheets. Uh, this low-tech state of affairs stands in stark contrast to the significant investment that global brands are making in technology generally. They're making this investment in their future because they know that good software is transformative, enabling them to operate more efficiently and opening new avenues for growth. Enterprise translation management software brings these benefits to the process of translation. And translation today is, is stuck in the past, and it, and it isn't fun by any means. <laughs> However, cloud-based software enables global brands to take a smarter, more strategic approach to translation. The sheer, the sheer amount of complexity of manual effort required to accomplish this using the traditional services-based approach to translation makes it a practical impossibility. Using enterprise translation management software, however, brands can set budgets and have decisions about the allocation of these budgets be made automatically based on a combination of business rules, data, and manual intervention. This makes entering new markets easier and lower risk. It maximizes return on investment in translation, and most importantly, it optimizes the global customer experience in a fiercely competitive environment. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of adopting a technology mindset to maximize global marketing ROI with translation and localization? 
So to answer that question, I, we, we, need to ask, we need to ask three important questions. Number one, does the current or prospective solution provide me with faster time to market? Number two, does it help me minimize the, the total cost over time? And number three, does it help me and my translation team get translations right the first time? So let's break each, uh, each of those down. So if a, if a faster time to market is a requirement for your brand, the software that you choose should incorporate the following. It should have seamless integration with your current process and technology. And there are two primary ways to achieve this, through APIs and through connectors. So a translation platform API is by far the most robust type of API available for complex enterprise use cases that require the utmost in security, support, and ongoing development. Translation connectors allow users to remain in the environment they are used to working in for any task related to content in other languages. This provides the efficiency and transparency you need to push and track your content through to publication in any language that you offer. And there's a whole host of different types of connectors out there. And some examples are CMS connectors like Adobe Experience Manager or Sitecore, WordPress, Drupal. And there are e-commerce platforms like Demandware. And you know, for someone like myself who <laughs> is in charge of marketing, marketing automation connectors are most important, ones like HubSpot and Marketo. And then there's process automation. Implementing the right translation management platform with an automated engine can streamline the process of content review and approval. Project owners can review the progress of the project on demand, most important. Reviewers, translators, and others providing translation services receive automated alerts when new tasks are ready for action, ready for action which virtually eliminates all bottlenecks while ensuring high-quality global content gets to market as quickly as possible. And lastly, custom-aided workflows. It's important to be able to, cu to create customized workflows that allow you to automate as much of the translation process as possible. Each of your content types requires different steps, including review process, sign-offs, sign -offs, and et cetera. But with customizable workflows, you can create as many translation quality review and approval steps that you need to, from s very simple translate, review, publish workflows to much more complicated workflows requiring subject matter experts and discussions over multiple approval cycles and even legal review. Okay, when the right technology is used, you will save money over time. And here are some features that will help you do that. First up is translation memory. For large-scale globalization and localization projects, translation memory is essential. Think of, it like, think of it like this. Think of it like a recording of every translation you've ever done. The best translations ensure a consistent tone and terminology from one type of content to another. Translation memory helps ensure that brands speak in a single voice, no matter how many translators have contributed to the translation. Brand consistency is a priority, especially when you're in the marketing team. Then there's resource allocation. Resources are a key concern for just about all marketers. Do you have the budget for localization? And how do you prove that that budget was well spent and will create revenue to pay for itself? How many people need to be involved? Using technology as the source of truth for your translation needs also helps align and allocate only the resources required thus freeing up people and developers to spend more time on customer-facing priorities. And then lastly, flexible translation options. So translation software allows brands to adjust their spend accordingly by excluding certain pages for translation or using a lower cost translation option. Similarly, brands should be able to expand their language support opportunistically. All of these decisions are flexible and should be driven by data like traffic, conversion, and customer demographics. Okay, so getting it translation right the first time. Uh, getting translation right the first time is absolutely critical to achieving a better ROI. Incorrect translations can slow momentum in new markets you're trying to enter and result in potential customers leaving your website looking quickly for competitive alternatives. So the rule here is don't settle for inferior translation tools. So let's talk about a few superior translation tools. First one and argu arguably most important is in-context view. 
The value of seeing global content translated and localized right in front of you as you make edits cannot be overstated. In-context translation and review allows for faster, more efficient collaboration on content projects. As the user can see how their updates and edits will look on your screen and on their screen, your translator screen, in real time. And then there's linguistic assets. So when preparing to translate website content, Developing a style guide and translation glossary can help speed up the process and ensure a smoother transition. A style guide will communicate aspects of your brand such as grammar, syntax, voice, tone. A glossary will tell your translator which terms should not be translated, such as your company name and maybe specific product names, as well as the meaning of any term terminology that is unique to your business. And finally, as far as getting it right the first time is concerned, Communication is absolutely everything. You need, to be sure that you, are, you need to be sure that you are employing a technology that allows you to communicate with your translators within the platform, no matter where they are, around the world, at any time. Eliminate the, inf the inefficiencies of emailing questions and contact back and forth. Make sure you can speak to your translators within the platform. Okay. So I have, a, I have a short case study here for you, um, and this case study is with one of our clients, the Intercontinental Hotels Group, IHG. And a while back, Intercontinental Hotel Group it came to us looking for a solution for continuous improvement in their go-to-market process for delivering their IHG reward programs to loyal users around the globe. So their VP of Global Direct Channels uh, stated to us, um, when they were critically evaluating their guest journey, they realized that their lack of a technology system for managing translation and localization of their website, their mobile app, and their content was hindering their growth in global markets. So IHG said to us, we have some key requirements, right? And their key requirements for improving their translation management experience included the following. Seamless integration with their current technology stack. Process automation as, a primary, as primary. Ability to collaborate with the thousands of content creators, translators, and in-market consultants that they work with. Visibility into the cost, the timing, and the progress of translation projects. And then ultimately, cost efficiencies. So by, by leveraging enterprise translation technology, IHG has achieved an important competitive advantage when entering new markets. And here are a few stats. They have more than 5,000 hotels in nearly 100 countries. They're publishing all of their content in more than a dozen languages. And they have more than 1,300 hotels around the world in the development pipeline. And they're using translation management software to allow them to gain that competitive advantage and get to market and deliver outstanding customer experiences. Okay, so my last slide here, some key takeaways. And, and this is really a wrap up of uh, Lily, Sebastian, and, and myself. Um, and there were three things that really stood out. And so the first one is there's a huge opportunity, right? There's a growing online and mobile populations, and e-commerce markets are driving globalization. Number two, a turnkey solution helps you access global opportunities faster and more affordably than building infrastructure and assembling services yourself. And then finally, number three, enterprise translation management technology enables global brands to make it, take a smarter, more strategic approach to translation and focus on delivering winning customer experiences. And from my point of view as a marketer, that is of utmost importance. Thank you very much. Judd, thanks so much for helping drive those key takeaways and give us some wrap-up for today's webinar. I think. Uh, we have some questions from our audience and would love to jump right into those if uh, the panel is, is ready. Um, so Judd, we have a, a question I think for you, uh, and it talks about, it says, can you use translation memory across multiple channels, for example, uh, across mobile apps and websites? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that technology is available. Um, you know, and, and as far as websites go, everything that uh, we just spoke about, uh, specifically myself and Sebastian in the webinar, uh, speaks directly to that. Yes, you know we, uh, you know at least with uh, Smartling's uh, platform, you know you're able to 
translate your website. You're able to translate any type of content that you have, whether they're documents or marketing content, what have you. And, and I think most importantly, and Lily mentioned this, I think everybody might be sick of hearing about mobile, but it is a real reality. Um, and we recognize that too. Smartling uh, just released a mobile version of their platform about a week ago. So, you know, we are catering to the, um, you know, to the mobile need from our biggest global customers. Mobile is really driving everything right now and certainly advancing uh, as, as we move along. Uh, there is another question here about, um, it asks, how does SmartLink technology overcome the issue of direct translation being off? This is really about getting it right the first time, I think. It says, are local translators reviewing the translated text for accuracy and cultural relevancy? Yes, they are, and, and, that, and that is part of the reason why you employ them. I think, you know, from a, from a brand's perspective or a, let's say, a SmartLink customer perspective, you, know, you have an opportunity to work with any translator that you so choose. So we have some brands that prefer to work with their own translators, um, and, they, and they employ them, and they do all of that work that you mentioned for them directly. And sometimes they come to us and say, hey, can we use your translator network, and we offer up, uh, you know, the resources and the people that we have uh, that are already using our platform. The most important part is it, it, it's never really off because, you know, you're constantly needing to translate your content, update your website, and you have people working in different parts of the world around the globe, and they're, they're, they're working either with you at the same time or they're working on their, uh, at their own speed during their own free time. But the most important thing is the software keeps track of everything. If you go to bed and you think it's off, it's been working all night, and you turn it on when you get into work, and it shows you your progress of all your projects, and it allows you to communicate directly with your translator to make sure that if you see something you don't like, you can jump on it straight away. And if you do, you hit approve, you move on, and uh, you sell some product on your website around the world. Really important engagement uh, there for our audience. Um, do you have a question from the audience that says, uh, what would you recommend the best way that a startup company could enter a global market? It could be for anyone. Is this, is it, is this for me or for everybody? Uh, it's, I think you guys could bat that around. It's, it's not targeted at a particular panelist. I mean, I think sure, I'll, you I know, can take the first Go ahead, Lily. Sure, you start. <laughs> so, I mean, it, obviously it 100% it depends on your business and your product line. Um, you know, if you're – offering digital goods or physical goods. I mean, when we talk about retailers um, in particular, it's, there's, there's, I talked about the sort of the three approaches and the level of localization or investment needed in, in, in those three approaches. The first approach that I mentioned quickly was the cross-border shipping piece. Um, and I think that's, that's a really lovely sort of toe-in-the-water strategy for firms who have, you know, um, maybe, you know, don't have buckets and buckets and buckets of money and budget um, to, to invest in, in globalizing. And so um, in, in that way, you add, you know, your, your core .com domestic site, you add international shipping options to that. Um, and, and there are vendors out there that help with that, but they're generally, you know, relatively affordable approaches. You know, you're, you're talking about five to ten you know, if your inventory fees are really complex, it could go to 20k um, for for those startup fees. But then it's a you know nine to 12 percent revenue share on those just those parcels that are being shipped overseas, and that's really the 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 and then you can control the levers of localization from there. So you know, obviously, because it's key to boosting conversion rate, you might think of language you know language translation after that. But but really, the first step we see is currency conversion and payment methods and things like that. Um, but you can control those 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 levers more easily. And from a um, you know a digital goods perspective, if you're you're not having to worry about fulfillment, then you've got one major you know obstacle of globalization sort of <laughs> that you don't even have to worry about. And then you're you know more free to focus on SEO and and driving traffic to your um, uh, domestic site first to to then collect that data. One of the things I've heard someone say that that resonates with me so much is, you know, go to the data as fast as you can. The data whispers the truth. Um, and that's really true in that case, too. I would say, you know, you have to, to really look at where your data is telling you the path, your pathway to globalization is. I'm going to steal that quote, Lily, warning you. I love that. <laughs> it's a beautiful quote. Um, we, uh, we, Lily, we actually have another question for you, and this is, um, uh, involves the case study about Chelsea Football Club that you'd offered. It says, what local marketing strategies did Chelsea Football Club use to drive consumers to their site since there was no local club there? 
Hmm. So I don't know. I couldn't. Spe- I can't speak to what Chelsea, you know, the, the club did directly. I, I didn't work with them on that. But um, you know, one of the things that we talk about quite a bit, and I should say, you know, I don't. I don't cover marketing. Um, I, I cover e-commerce. But one of the, the main things that that folks do is look at um, SEO because, you know, if you look at the, some of the key markets that, that Chelsea Football Club ended up targeting. Google either shares the spotlight or is totally dominated by another another search engine. So you've got, you know, Baidu in China, you've got uh, Yahoo in Japan, um, Yandex in, in Russia, and um, Naver in, in South Korea. And there's a whole, you know, different set of metrics and different sort of, um, again, levers to pull in terms of boosting SEO and those different um, those different uh, search engines. And then the other thing that I would say is um, the the keywords. So when you look at, you know, what, what search terms are really relevant to your business and that are being used in that, in that market, um, digital agencies can help you sort of figure that out. Um, and it, it may not be the literal translation of your, of your product. I mean, one of the you know, there's a lot of sort of Spanglish or, you know, English um, and, and local language um, meshing as it comes to, to search terms and things, and you may see a dramatic difference in your um, your search traffic if you um, embed the, the appropriate, and it may be a hybrid sort of English-Spanish or, you know, English-Italian or whatever it might be term within your um, site context and, and make sure to sort of boost your, your um, or, or construct your SEO strategy around those appropriate search terms. Um, and then lastly, in, in a lot of markets, um, some of these, like uh, YouTube and, and social and all of these channels are even more important than in the U.S. You know, Latin America, for example, recently we, we found we, our data showed that it's something like 60% um, in, of online consumers in, in Argentina share um, content that brands um, share on social media on a weekly basis or more. I mean, that number in the U.S. is something like, tw- you know, 20%. Um, so it, it, in Mexico, it was something of, you know, 40 or 50. It's just in, in certain markets, you'll see that social and, um, you know, video, online video might be um, even better for, for driving traffic and boosting awareness than, than in your domestic market. Thank you, Lily. We have um, a broad question about the report. An uh, audience member is like, uh, where can they see the full TEI report that uh, Sebastian covered? Yeah, great. This is Judd. I can feel that one. So, you know, jump on over to uh, smartling.com, and we have the report available uh, on our homepage, or you could stop over on resources.smartling.com, uh, and you can view the entire thing there. And, you know, I did notice that there was another question about the the um, interviewee, the SmartLink client, that is confidential, so we don't reveal that. But uh, I encourage you to check out the report because it's uh, it's uh, loaded with a lot a lot of great stats and, and a lot of context on, on how this customer was using uh, the SmartLink platform. Thank you, Judd. And we actually have another question about implementation here. It says, how would you advise implement, implementing a translation strategy across – multi-channel platforms? Good question. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a tough one to answer, um, you know, uh, in general. Um, but I, l- let's put it this way. I think that, uh, you know, one of the first things across multi-channel platforms is look at what's currently in your technology stack. Okay, so if you are, you know, you have automation technology, you have HR technology, you know, you have your CMS. Um, I think one of the, the the best ways in from an integration standpoint, uh, from an implementation standpoint, is to find out, you know, what other so- can the platform that you're choosing connect with the software that you currently use. Um, that is one of the best indicators of uh, will this product, or will this platform seamlessly integrate with my current technology stack? I mean, that's a very real scenario. We have a lot of people that. Come come to SmartLink via their connectors with Zendesk or Marketo or Adobe Experience Manager or Drupal. So that, that is usually one of the um, paths of least resistant to uh, choosing a platform and then setting it up and being able to use it relatively immediately. Excellent. I think we have time for about two more questions. I do have one here uh, specific to software. So it says, does the SmartLink platform include 
the TM software, or do we need to source it from a different technology vendor? No, absolutely. It, the SmartLink platform includes it. Excellent. And sorry, going through my deck. Uh, we did have a question regarding um, how do you work with the translation providers directly? Again, we, back to the um, the folks I think at the ground level, Judd. Yeah, sure. So look, like I mentioned this earlier, I alluded to it. Like we, the brands that we work with, they already have translators, um, translation service providers that they work with, and they trust that understand their brand, their brand voice, etc. And they want to continue working with them. So you know, the the you know SmartLink's technology kind of sits in between those two parties. So adding SmartLink technology into your current process will give you all those inherent benefits of using technology, but allows you to keep your relationship with your current provider. If if you're launching for the first time in another market around the globe or you're looking to replace your current you know, uh, language service provider, what have you, you there's a couple ways to do it. There are close to 30,000 language service providers around the world offering these types of translation services. Um, or you can work directly with SmartLing, and, and we have a, a marketplace of translators um, that we can introduce you to. And then you can choose and find out who is right for your brand. But I think ultimately, no matter where you find this person, it's making sure that you are working with people that understand your brand, understand your voice, understand what your objectives are, and then building a trusting relationship with them so that you always are ensuring quality, um, you're always ensuring that projects are done on time, that people are treating your brand in the right way and allowing you to communicate with your customers around the globe. Excellent. Super helpful and, and again, just showing how important it is to, to get your brand message right at that local level. Um, so it looks like we're really just about out of time today. And on behalf of SmartLing and Target Marketing, I wanted to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Please be sure to check out our webinar page to get information on all of our archived and upcoming webinars. And if you wouldn't mind, if you could just take a minute to fill out the brief feedback survey that's about to appear on your screen next, we would be grateful. Uh, it's your feedback that influences the webinars and content that we will be bringing to you in the future. So I certainly hope to see everyone at the next Target Marketing webinar. Thanks so much, everybody.